let's say we suspect we have histamine intolerance and then we have it confirmed. At what point do we decide whether or not we should seek further clarification um, and investigation into whether it's a mast cell disorder or not? That is something that at the moment is really um, difficult in, even in clinical practice because in at least in North America and to mm, some extent to the UK, neither condition is very well understood. Uh, there's a lot of questions, especially around histamine intolerance. You know, is it real? Is it something that we should be looking at, but it's not in our medical literature to the extent that we feel uh, that we should have it in clinical practice? On the other hand, mastocytosis uh, or mast cell disorders, I, I should put it that way, because mastocytosis actually, uh, it's got about 10 different subtypes, as you probably are well aware. Um, there's a cutaneous type, the systemic type, and then various subtypes of those. Mm. And more and more um, immunologists and hematologists are, are becoming quite knowledgeable about that condition. Uh, we've got far more tests available for it now than we did uh, in the even recent past. Um, tryptase levels, for example, are, are becoming much more um, tested um, in laboratories generally, uh, and um, it, it's much more recognized as a disease entity. Um, on the other hand, histamine intolerance, very, I, I mean, it's very obvious that to anyone who has it, for example, and certainly for us who, who work in the field constantly, uh, because the presenting symptoms are so clear and it responds so well to a histamine-restricted diet. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, of course, mastocytosis won't respond to that degree because histamine is only one of many mediators mm. uh, released in mast cell disorders. So histamine, a uh, histamine-restricted diet on its own will, will not give the um, level of response that one would see with a diamine oxidase deficiency, which would be um, uh, what one would look for in a, in a histamine-sensitive um, person. Of course, both conditions can occur together, but very, very rarely because, I mean, mastocytosis itself is a rare disease, mm -hmm. and to have that plus a diamine oxidase deficiency, which is often inherited, um, is a very rare combination. Mm -hmm. What I am finding is, it, as you say, there, there, I don't know that many people with mastocytosis who have concurrent diamine oxidase deficiency, but at the same time, most of them are in the United States where they don't actually test for DAO, especially not for mastocytosis. But what I am finding is that a lot of people um, who have been now diagnosed with mast cell activation syndromes and disorders um, were initially diagnosed with histamine intolerance. So mm -hmm. at, at, that's, mm -hmm. at, at what point do you think somebody who suspects histamine intolerance or has been diagnosed with it should potentially seek further um, further diagnosis because obviously we don't want people to be worried because you know part of this condition no, is no. that you know with histamine intolerance it, it it usually goes undiagnosed for for quite some time you know by that time mm -hmm. we've been told that we're you know either imagining things or you know oh <laughs> yes it's all in your head. Well, exactly. yes, histamine is a neurotransmitter, so yes, it is. <laughs> but physiologically, not psychologically. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. It is in your head. It's a neurotransmitter. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, yes, you see, it's all in your head. So, yes, of course. It's a neurotransmitter. Where else do they function? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so yes, so I mean, in my case, I mean, um, but the thing is, I'm finding initially in my case, because I improved significantly on a low histamine diet initially, and then mm. I kind of had a bit of a relapse, and mm. w which I now know is also happening to people who only have histamine intolerance, 
Mm -hmm. And often people just think that maybe, you know, they're not doing the diet right, which is a possibility often when people write into me and often people aren't doing the diet as well as they, as, as, yeah. well as they could. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so in my case, I found that I, 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 I relapsed again and that's when I sought clarification. But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, the diet just needed to be tweaked a little bit to include more antihistamine and anti-inflammatory foods because as you said, mm -hmm. you know, mast cell disorders are so much more than just histamine. You know, and oh yes, oh yes. Histamine is only one mediator, whereas in mast cell disorders and the um, degranulation of mast cells, you've got leukotrienes, prostaglandins, chemotactic factors, cytokines. You've got a, you know a whole list of uh, mediators that are going to act on body systems. Mm. Exactly, and the, the wonderful thing is that diet can address those too. You know, uh, uh -huh. mangosteen for prostaglandin. You know, um, I think it was cucumbers for leukotriene. But in any case, the point is, yes, diet works for most disorders, at least to, you know, get the body functioning a little bit more normally. Do you think there is um, a necessity to go further into um, testing at some point if one isn't improving on just a low histamine diet? I think that is wise. I really do. And now it's not difficult to find practitioners who will look for mast cell um, disorders, um, especially in the United States. Unfortunately, in Canada, we do have people who are very well uh, known for mastocyte, uh, mastocytosis diagnoses and other mast cell disorders. Unfortunately, what we see uh, that's been reported to me is that the general practitioners are not that knowledgeable mm. and, and generally discourage, uh, not, not necessarily discourage, but they, they don't take it quite as far as they should. Mm. I, I've definitely mm. heard cases of discouragement. <laughs> Uh -huh. I didn't want to be too unkind to you. <laughs> so let's say, how long, how long would we expect to be on the low histamine diet and experience, is it realistic, well let's talk about, is it realistic to expect a complete resolution to symptoms on a low histamine diet if you have histamine intolerance? Some people do find that, yes, definitely. It depends. It's very much like lactose intolerance. It depends on how much of the enzyme their body are actually producing. Mm. And, of course, everybody is different, which means that some people will be producing quite a bit, and uh, but still not quite enough to keep them below the top of their bucket, for example. Mm. You know, they've still got to stay on that diet. Um, we also find, of course, that in times when more histamine is, histamine is being released because of allergy, then the histamine diet won't keep them below the top of their bucket. Because, for example, let's say it's the pollen season uh, for them, and, and they're having rhinitis and all sorts of hay fever symptoms, uh, their body's producing and releasing a lot more histamine. And so to keep themselves below the top of their bucket is going to be much more difficult, and perhaps the diet will not do it at that point. That's an excellent point, as is, I tell people, stress. Watch your stress levels. Oh, yes, stress, definitely. Definitely. I don't think people recognize that enough because the stress, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, is, which is where the, you know, we go around and the stress response and so on and so forth, um, cortisol levels, uh, release of histamine at each of the, the, the sites of the, 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 the cycle, for example, definitely a very, very important factor. Mm. Wonderful. And could I ask you something that's just come up a couple of times with um, with a couple of doctors about, is it possible to have a rebound effect from a low histamine diet whereby the body produces more histamine? I honestly don't know. I have seen no research literature that would indicate to me that that is, that is uh, the case. Mm. 